this evening at 4.59, um, I had actually planned to do something different than what I did. And um, I, when I got, actually when I got home this afternoon after church and all, and, and of course I told y'all that I was planning tonight to talk about marriage in our 6.30 service, and I was going to do something different at 4.59, but after I got home this afternoon, I just, I, I just was thinking, I said, you know, I really ought to do marriage in 459. Now, I'm having to change gears a little bit because, of course, in 459, you've got your middle schoolers and you've got your high schoolers, and none of them have been married yet. And I told them I hope they haven't been married yet at that point. But um, anyway, you know, tonight, the first thing that we're talking about is, you know, well, first of all, as we, you know, come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, you know, we want to build our lives on that firm foundation, on Christ, our solid rock, okay? But it goes the same way with marriage. And for a marriage to last, it has to have that firm foundation. And it's a true story. There was a neighborhood just outside of Chicago, and it was a really nice, well-kept neighborhood, nice homes, you know, families, many families. And, you know, it had been there for, you know, several years. But not too long after that, all of a sudden, they started to have problems in the neighborhood. The roads kind of began to start cracking. And, and some of the houses, the foundations started cracking and slipping, like one side would fall and stuff like that. And, and so when they started having all these problems throughout all the neighborhood, they decided, well, we better call in some experts and find out what's going on. Here, why you know things just seem to be crumbling and falling apart. Well, you know what they found out is that neighborhood when it was built, it was built on the site of an old garbage dump, and they did not you know check that out the foundation and the the undersoil and all of that when they went to build that neighborhood. Well, it's the same thing with marriage. If your marriage is not built on that solid foundation. That's why we have the divorce rate we have in our country today. Now, even though I'm talking about marriage, and let me say this, and we're going to be in the second chapter of Genesis tonight, so if you want to go ahead and turn there, we're going to look at the first married couple ever in the world. But even though we're talking about marriage, and I know, like I said in here, I'm having to change my tune a little bit from 459 because over there, there were a number of young people there that never had been married. And the first thing I told them was, don't feel like you have to get married someday. Because there's nowhere in Scripture where it says, thou shalt be married. You know, and one of the things we need to be careful of, and, and I was sort of made aware of this when Laura and I started dating, and Laura's mom was widowed, and, and she was single, is one of the things we have to be careful of is treating people who are single, whether they've never been married or whether they've been married and, and lost a husband or a wife or, or whether a marriage is ended in a divorce or whatever. If they're single, we don't need to treat them like they're some strange beings or some different characters. You know, and, and if you're here tonight and you happen to be single, don't let anyone ever treat you like a second-class citizen. And I know that's hard for our society. And I know in a lot of ways, you know, especially when you get to be a certain age, people just expect you to get married. And if they find out that you're single, they're like, oh, you're kidding, you know? But you don't ever need to let anybody, if you're single, whatever the situation, treat you like you're different or an outcast or, or, or a second-class citizen. Because as I said, God doesn't say that we have to be married. You know, even Scripture even talks about, you know, Paul talks about the importance of being single and about completely devoting and surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Paul even talks about that in Scripture. So I just kind of wanted to say that up front. And, and before we read the Scripture, I want, we're going to look at four principles tonight as far as building marriage on a solid foundation. And, and again, you know, if you're not married at this point in time, who knows, you may someday remarry. You may not ever want to remarry, and that's fine too. But who knows? And, and I think, first of all, if, if you're not married, one of the things we can do is teach our children, 
And many of you, your grandchildren, and even your great-grandchildren, when they get to be that age, what it means to have a marriage built on a solid foundation. You know, we can certainly do that. But we're going to look at four principles. We're going to look at the purpose of marriage. Uh, we're going to look at the priority of marriage, the permanence of marriage, and then the purity of marriage. But let me read this passage in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. And we'll read here to the end of the chapter there. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. Now, notice it starts off in verse 18. It says, it's not good for a man to be alone. And then it goes on to say, well, God had formed all of these animals, all these beasts out of the ground, out of the dust of the earth. Well, was Adam alone? No, he wasn't alone. I mean, there were animals around. You know, there were birds and, you know, all kinds of animals. So he wasn't alone. But what is it talking about here when it says it was not good for Adam to be alone? It says that God said, I will make a helper suitable for him. See, in all these beasts of the field and all these animals, there was not one found that could complement Adam. See, God designed us human beings to be relational creatures. You know, I know they've done studies in the past, you know, discovered... Like young children, and this is so sad, and I, I hate to even bring it up, but it's happened where young children have entered into this world and they've pretty much been locked away for a long, long time. And those that have been locked away when they were discovered and brought out into the world, they can't interact because they've not had that human contact, that human relationship. And it's because God designed us to be relational creatures. To have that human interaction one with another. And especially in the marriage relationship between a man and a woman. Let me finish reading there. And he says in the last part of verse 20, But for Adam no suitable helper was found. And so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So what is the purpose of marriage we see from this passage here? And two purposes. First of all, obvious purpose, companionship. You know, we've already seen, even though it says it was not good for man to be alone, it wasn't good for Adam to be alone, and then there were all these animals and all these beasts in the field, Adam was alone. He didn't have that suitable helper. That compliment mate. And so God made woman. You see, God designed each and every one of us, designed humans for um, an intimate, he, he designed, hold on, he designed humans with the need for an intimate relationship and understanding this type of relationship that he wants with us to help us understand. I mean, that's why God created us. So he too could have an intimate relationship with us as well. And we have an intimate relationship with Him. But God designed the most intimate human relationship to be between a man and a woman. And He designed that most intimate human relationship between a man and a woman to be within the boundaries of marriage. And you know, and I told our young folks over there and. and this is so important, I think, for each of y'all to hear. It's been so acceptable in our society. And I've even seen it with young people that Laura and I work with that, that came up in the youth group in our church. But it's become so acceptable in society that when two people like each other, 
that it's okay to live together. They may have intention to get married one day. And so they think, well, we're going to get married eventually. So there's no problem for us living together up front. But God designed that most intimate human relationship between a man and between a woman to be within the boundaries of marriage. And you know, when God tells us in Scripture, when He says, you know, when He gave us His commandments in Exodus and Leviticus, and He says, Thou shall, He says, Thou shall, because it will bring you joy, it will bring you happiness, it will be for your benefit. But when He says, Thou shalt not, it's because it will cause you harm. It will not lead to joy. It will only lead to misery and unhappiness. <clears throat> See, God tells us and gives us instructions for our benefit, for our good, because He loves us. Not just because He wants to give us a bunch of rules and regulations. You see, your spouse should be your, and y'all may not know this term, some of you may know it. This is the term teenagers use. Your spouse should be your BFF. Y'all heard that before? Y'all know what that means? Your best friend forever. That's what BFF stands for. Your spouse should be your best friend forever. And, and I told them over there tonight, Laura and I dated for about three years before we actually got engaged and got married. But we were friends. And there is no greater joy in this world to be able to be married to your best friend forever. No greater joy. The second purpose behind marriage is to provide a companion that makes our life complete. That brings us fulfillment. It says in verse 18, a helper suitable. A helper that helps you become a better person. A helper that helps you, helps your life feel more fulfilled and more content. I gave them this news flash tonight over 459. And the news flash is, men and women are different. <laughs> but God designed it that way intentionally. To make each other complete. To complement each other. To help each other expand our interests. To help each other to expand and further develop our characters. And to balance our responsibilities. And, and I told them over there tonight. I used several examples between Laura and I. Because Laura's the only wife I've ever had. And the only marriage I've been part of. So that's the only experience I've had as far as marriage. Thank the Lord. Okay? But when Laura and I got married, and you know, we, we've had our disagreements and, and our frustrations with each other and, and all that. And, and Laura and I have been married 27 years, and I probably need like Lawrence and Peggy to come teach most of this because Tuesday they'll have been married 61 years, okay? They ought to have it down pat by now, right? <laughs> Which just goes to show you that marriage is a work always in progress. <laughs> always in progress. But when Laura and I first got married, and, and you know, we certainly had our differences. One of the differences we had is when I got angry, when I got upset, when I got mad, I would hold it in. I would just leave the room. I didn't like to argue. And when Laura got mad, she was the one, she had to let it out. She couldn't hold it in. But as we've been together longer, in some ways we've kind of grown more towards the middle. <laughs> Another way, and, and I'm going to use this terminology and I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but I'm not much of a talker. You may not believe that, but I'm not much of a talker, which is another way how our marriage has sort of brought us both more towards the middle. But when we got married, and we'd be sitting and Lord would say, let's talk. I'd say, okay, what you want to talk about? I don't know. And she'd use this term. She said, let's just shoot the bull. That was the term she would use. She said, why do we have to talk about anything? Let's just, can't you just shoot the bull? I said, no. If I'm going to talk, I'm going to have a reason behind what I'm going to say. <laughs> But, you know, the longer we are married together, you complement each other and you kind of come more 
towards the middle. You know, a common reason that's given for divorce is we just don't have anything in common anymore. That's the common reason for people getting divorced. Well, that difference is going to force you to do one of two things. One, you're either going to fight like cats and dogs because neither one of you want to change. Or the second choice, you're going to humble yourself and you're going to use those differences. And boy, that's a key word, is it not even in marriage? Humility, humbleness, and use those differences to complement one another and to build each other up. You know, an inflexible, stiff, unbending relationship is going to eventually break. The second thing, the priority of marriage. It says in verse 24, a man shall leave his father and his mother. You know what that's saying? Is that first of all, in our relationships, first of all, as a believer, the most important relationship is our relationship with our Lord and Savior. But in the marriage relationship, after that, the second most important relationship is the husband-wife relationship. And if you've got children, then the third most important relationship is parent and child. There are so many families. It's another common reason you hear for divorce. Well, my husband or, or my wife just, just can't let go of their parents. Or, or the parent just can't let go of their child. You know? But folks, when you're married, when you become husband and wife, that's why it says a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And you know what that word united literally means? It actually means to be glued together. To be stuck together. To be blended together. And, and you, you can think of the illustration as when you're cooking something and you're blending all these ingredients together. And once you blend all these ingredients together when you're cooking, have you ever tried to separate out those ingredients again once they blend blended together? You can't do it. It's the same thing with a marriage relationship. You know, if you've got, if you're being pulled, say like by two cords from opposite ends, one of those cords is eventually going to break. One of those cords is eventually going to break. There's a story about a mother and a father who gave their daughter away in marriage. And after the honeymoon, of course, their daughter and, and her new husband, they ended up settling down several states away from her parents. Well, a few weeks later, the phone rang, and the mother answered the phone, and the daughter was there, and she was just all in tears and just all upset and just crying because her and her husband had had their first fight. So the mother basically gave the phone to the father. <laughs> Here, talk to your daughter. And the father took the phone and spent about 10 minutes talking with his little girl on the phone, and when he came back, the mother said, well, what did she say? And the father said, well, they had a fight. And she said she wanted to come home. Well, after a moment of silence, the mom said, well, what did you tell her? And the father said, I told her she is home. See, this father knew that when our children leave and they start their own family and they have their own husband, their own wife, their relationship together as husband and wife is more important than that parent-child relationship. And it should still be the same for those of us who have children at home. God and our relationship is top priority. Husband-wife relationship is second priority. And then parent-child relationship third priority. See, parents, the time is going to come and, and Laura and I have experienced this, but the time will come, and many of you have already experienced this too, where you're going to need to let go of your children and let them fly. I've heard Laura say many times, she, she, we like to think that we've raised our children to fly. And when we say fly, that means fly to wherever God will lead them, not just fly around the house. You know, of course, sometimes they are like, you know, homing pigeons. They'll fly out for a little while, then they fly back home. <laughs> But we like to think that we raised our children to fly. And husbands and wives, the time is going to come when you need to turn loose of your parents. And it goes both ways. But it doesn't mean that that parent-child relationship is cut. It just means that 
after marriage, that parent-child relationship is no longer the most important relationship. The third thing, the permanence of marriage. Look at what we read in verse 23. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And then in verse 24, it says a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. See, that united, like I said earlier, means glued together, stuck together. And, it, and once things are blended together and stuck together, they can't be separated again. And so many people enter into a marriage relationship, and, and let me just say this up front. If you happen to be one that maybe experienced a bad marriage relationship, I want you to know right off the bat the God that loves you is also a God that is merciful and is a God of grace and a God of forgiveness. And there is nothing that He won't forgive. You know, I, I've just seen so many believers, they don't have as much of a problem with God forgiving us they have more of the problem of us forgiving ourselves. But when we know God has forgiven us, certainly we can forgive ourselves and we can learn from whatever mistakes we've made in the past. But anyway, how, what are, I've got like four C's here regarding the permanence of marriage. How do we keep marriage together? As glue, stuck together like glue. Four C's. The first C, very obvious, commitment. I remember, Lord, I, before we were engaged, and when we first started talking about getting married, I remember, Lord, I specifically, we already had our minds made up that if we continued in that path and we ultimately got married one day, it was going to be for life. That divorce wasn't even a consideration. And for the life of a believer and in the marriage relationship, now I understand, I know that there are people in this world um, that have ended up, that have been married and that have ended up in divorce as no fault of their own. You know, I, I've known pastors in the past who have been married and their wives or their husbands or whatever, I, I say pastors, pastors, their wives or even women, their husbands, have just left and they've had no say-so in the matter. They've just upped and left. And you know, that's not your fault. That is not your fault. But the four C's, one is commitment. Marriage is for life. The second C, choice. To love your mate till death do you part. It's a choice. And I told the young people over there, folks, I hope you'll go back and tell your, your children if they're not, if you've got children that aren't married yet, but you'll tell your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren that they need to decide right now whether they're dating or not dating, whether they're 10 years old or whether they're 15, 16, 17 years old, they need to decide right now what choice they're going to make if it's God's plan and purpose for them to be married. And is that choice going to be when I get married... It's going to be for life. Till death do us part. I think that's one of the greatest things you can teach your children, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren. The third C, cultivate. And I already mentioned this earlier. Marriage is always a work in progress. Cultivate that love and that relationship with one another. And then the fourth C, close. Get close. Not only close to each other, but get as close as you possibly can to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's that solid foundation. And then the last thing, the purity of marriage. Jesus said in John 10, 10, maybe you know this verse, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. You see, God's plan for us, for His creation, for His children, is to have the best life possible. And I hate to even use those words. I told them over there tonight because it sounds so Joel Osteenish. 
But it is true. God's plan for each and every one of us individually is to have that best life possible, to enjoy life to its absolute fullest. And that also goes for the marriage relationship. To have the best marriage possible. To have the best relationship possible with your husband or with your wife. You see, God's commands, as I said earlier, were designed for our good, for our benefit, because He loved us. And that's why He gives us instructions and guidelines for the institution of marriage and what He intended marriage to be. You know, that intimate relationship between a man and a woman, God's designed it. There's no exceptions. But God designed it to be within marriage. Not outside of the marriage relationship. And the reason why God strictly forbids that is for our benefit. For our good. So we've discussed the purpose, the priority, the permanence, the purity of marriage. And let me just say... If, if you're here tonight and you're married and you may be going through some struggles in your marriage relationship, let me give you this advice. First, get as close to Jesus as you can and seek Him first. And then the second thing, be the best spouse you can be. It's humbleness. It's humility. And it's just like Jesus gave his life for us. He didn't expect anything in return, did he? Only our lives. But get as close to Jesus as you can. Be the best spouse you can be. And for those who may be here tonight and may feel that maybe they failed in their marriage, first of all, just confess to God, to your spouse. To your ex-spouse, if they're still around, and accept God's forgiveness, like I said earlier. He is God always willing to forgive. And then the second thing, seek the Lord above all else. And the third thing, again, if you're in another marriage relationship, commit to be the best spouse that you can be. And then I'm going to close with this. Last verse, verse 25. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now, that verse was not... I believe every single verse that's in Scripture is there for a reason. And this verse was not put in here just so we'll know, okay, Adam and Eve, they didn't have to worry about clothes to begin with. Certainly they were literally naked. But let me explain to you, when Adam and Eve were created, when God created them, He created them perfect beings. They had that perfect relationship with each other. They had that perfect relationship with the world. And it says they were naked and they felt no shame. And the reason was because they had nothing to feel ashamed about. There was no sin. There was no corruption. There was no guilt. God created it all perfect in perfect harmony. <coughs> and when, when we do what God's commanded us to do and live according to the way God's commanded us to live, then we don't have to feel guilty. We don't have to feel ashamed. And that's certainly the way God wants us to live. But even if we fail Him, and Lord knows, Lord knows, we've all failed Him many, many times over. <coughs> but He's a God who loves. He's a God who will always love. And he's God who forgives. Especially one who comes to him with a sincere and repentant heart. <coughs> he does forgive. Let me pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. And dear Lord, I pray tonight, first and foremost, that God, what's come out of my mouth tonight has been your word. And not mine. Dear Lord, I just pray, Father, that what we've heard tonight, whether those here are married or whether they're not, whether they've been married, whether they've never been married, Father, I just pray tonight that we understand through the marriage relationship, first and foremost, 
the type of relationship that you desire to have with us. And dear God, I believe that's really one of the reasons why you instituted the sanctity of marriage. It's to help us see, to help us get a glimpse and to understand, to know the love that you have for us and that personal, close, intimate relationship you want to have with us. Dear God, I also just pray tonight that those who are here, who are still blessed to have a husband and wife by their side, Father, I just pray that, Father, we've been encouraged and challenged, Father, to be the best spouses we can be. But, Father, most of all, that, Father, we'll seek you above everything else and we'll get as close to you as we possibly can. Because, dear Lord, we know that that just builds just a strong foundation for all the relationships that we have. And, dear Lord, if there's one here tonight, Father, who may have lost a spouse, Father, I just pray tonight that, Father, they just praise you and just thank you for the time they had together with that spouse and for the marriage relationship that you gave them. Father, again, if there's one here tonight who maybe feels like they've made mistakes, especially in the marriage relationship, dear Lord, I just pray, Father, that tonight they would just come before you and just with a sincere and repentant heart, Father, to seek your forgiveness and to know without a doubt, Father, that you have forgiven and you will forgive. And dear God, we thank you for being that God who loves us. God of son full of mercy and grace and a God who just gives us many, many chances, Father. A God who's always willing to accept us back with arms wide open. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name.